good morning and good evening to those of you tuning in to our webinar on DMAC techniques with Dr. Praveen Vidavali and Dr. Matthew Gigengak. We're pleased to have you here today. My name is Samara Andrade, and I'm the Senior Director for Clinical Training at SiteLife. I wanted to start by thanking Orbis and the entire CyberSite team for making this webinar possible. Through our longstanding partnership in times like these, we're still able to provide access to educational opportunities to those of you all around the world. Before we jump into this webinar, I'll take a few moments just to give you a little background about SiteLife. Our mission is to eliminate corneal blindness by 2040. We do this through a health systems approach working in these five program areas. The first is advocacy and policy where we support national governments and the eye health care system in having an enabling policy environment. This helps ensure that there is cornea tissue available and that the health system is able to provide access to care to those in need. We also work on prevention and awareness raising. We do this by preventing the progression of eye trauma like corneal abrasions into ulcers and ultimately blindness. We do this working with community health workers and eye hospitals in rural communities. We also support access to clinical training like this webinar today, supporting educational opportunities for cornea care providers around the world. We also work in iBank developments, supporting the dissemination of best practices and supporting the eye health ecosystem by ensuring that iBanks have access to the types of training, information, and educational opportunities that help them function at the highest possible efficiencies. We also work in innovation and access, supporting access to innovative solutions to improve access to high quality, affordable care empowering local healthcare providers to treat their communities quicker and more efficiently. Most of you today are probably most interested in our clinical training program. Since 2013, we've trained more than 1,400 ophthalmologists in low and middle income countries. We do this working with a global network of cornea care providers, which includes surgeons like Dr. Praveen Vadivali and Dr. Matthew Gikengak as well as experts that help us develop peer-reviewed educational curriculum opportunities in short-term fellowships, skills transfer courses, and symposiums in a variety of techniques like PKP, DSEC, DMAC, SLET, as well as courses for other healthcare providers such as transplant nurses, optometrists, allied ophthalmic personnel, general ophthalmologists. This global team of faculty also serve as coaches and mentors for corneal surgeons around the world, just like you. Today, we're absolutely thrilled to have two of these faculty here to share their best practices on DMAC techniques. Dr. Praveen Vidadvali is located at LV Prasad Institute in Hyderabad, India. And Dr. Matthew Gikengak is located in North Carolina at the Wake Forest University Medical School. Both of these surgeons have supported our program and amazing skills transfer courses and curriculum around the world. We couldn't be more thrilled to have them here with you today to share some of their knowledge. With that, I'll hand over to Dr. Praveen Vidavali to get us started. Hey, uh, thanks a lot, Samara. And uh, thanks again to uh, SiteLife for actually this wonderful opportunity to be able to share uh, some of the things that uh, I'm sure we've learned over the last several years. Uh, just to uh, give you an overview of what we would be covering today, uh, since we only have about an hour and a little more uh, with us, uh, we're going to be uh, limiting what we're going to be talking to you to the most important aspects. And we thought that uh, I would uh, cover the transition from DSEC to DMEC, and also a little bit about uh, preparing a donor graph for those of you who uh, do not have access to uh, pre-stripped corneas from the eye bank. Uh, and then Dr. Geegan Gak is going to be talking mainly about the steps in DMAC surgery with focus on loading, uh, delivering, and unfolding the graft. And we'll end with a little bit about post-op management. In the meanwhile, while one of us is not speaking, we will be available to answer your questions on the chat. So please feel free uh, to put in your questions and uh, one of us will try our best to try and answer that. Uh, so the title of what I'm going to be talking to you is actually transitioning from uh, DSEC to DMEC. And uh, I figured that this was important because this is amongst the most important uh, steps at which 
you you probably uh, need to un to understand the subtle variations between doing DSEC and then transitioning to DMEC. Uh, so we also have a number of audience poll questions as we go along with the presentations. So it would be really nice if you could uh, have your responses ready so all of us get to know where you're at and uh, we can actually change the focus of our presentations based on some of your responses. To, st to start off, this is uh, the first question that we had for you uh, to understand uh, what kind of practices you're involved in and uh, what percentage of your endothelial transplants currently are DMEC. Uh, would that be 0% up to 25%, 25 to 50%, up to 75%, and I hope nobody says 100%, but still we have to have that in there. So uh, please go ahead and uh, send in your responses and uh, let's see uh, how the distribution is depending on uh, potentially the kind of access that you have to tissue and the kind of patients uh, that you have access to as well. Uh, so get to your uh, devices, your computers or your phones and please uh, select your response. And in a couple of seconds, we'll uh, share the response. And uh, that is a pretty interesting statistic. So 0% uh, is more than 50% of the attendees today. Uh, about 30% uh, is up, up to 25%. And the, uh, I have a 1% who's 100% DMEX surgeon, which is really nice. So uh, let's see if you can actually uh, talk about the basics. And I think this is a really nice metric to have because we're going to be focusing mainly on trying to transition between what you're doing to DMEC. So why do you need to transition and what are the reasons why you think of transitioning to uh, DMEC from DSEC? Well, there are several reasons that I could think of uh, and I've listed them down here, but actually go through each of those individually with some evidence to show that each of these are important reasons to consider transitioning from DSEC to DMEC in appropriate cases, of course. Well, firstly, DSEC, you would notice, is not anatomically as natural as DMEC is. You are gonna take out only the Desmase membrane and some cases not even that, and then replace it with a larger tissue uh, which includes the stroma from the donor as well as the endothelium and the desmase membrane. Now, if you contrast that with DMEC, you are removing the desmase and the endothelium and you're not really changing the anatomy of the cornea because you're replacing it with exactly the same layers in the eye. So it actually makes a lot more sense to be anatomically more natural than to add in tissue that potentially is not required inside the eye. The second and potentially for me, one of the most important reasons is the fact that DMAC has been shown to have a much lesser risk of rejection after a transplant compared to DSEC. In fact, it seems that DMAC has an eight to 10 fold reduction in the potential for rejection after a transplant uh, based on this article from Francis Price's group uh, about a couple of years ago. And this is important because not only do we consider this as an important uh, piece of information for patients who are virgin patients who are undergoing transplants, but also for post previous keratoplasty who need a second transplant where typically the risk of rejection is higher, potentially DMEC can reduce that risk because of the reduction in the total amount of antigenicity or antigenically uh, stimulating tissue that you're transplanting inside the eye. Number three is better visual quality. I have not seen a surgery that gives better vision from the perspective of a coronal transplant compared to DMEC. And because of the fact that it is anatomically so neutral, the potential for the patient achieving a complete visual recovery as well as having exceptionally good visual quality is much higher than most other surgeries where there might be uh, sutures involved or tissues that potentially are not wanted in the eye. And that's the reason why you see a very high percentage of patients with 20-20 and some patients with 20 by 16 vision as well. Number four, if you're combining your surgery with cataract surgery as well, you have a much more predictable IOL power. Typically, DSEC, because of the thicker edges of the graft in the periphery, will result in a hyperopic shift, about a 1.5 diopters in the early post-op period and this reduces to about a diopter and sometimes less than that in about three to six months or so. 
But then again, this is dependent on the thickness of the peripheral tissue because it changes the posterior curvature of the cornea. Well, compared to DMAC, BMAC results in a very little or minimal shift in the refractive power of the eye and an average shift of a hyperopia of about 0.5 diopters is what is expected. So you need to en ensure that you correct for that when you implant an IOL. And most of the patients after DMAC surgery are reflectively quite neutral from the point of view of spherical error. Well, visual recovery is very quick after DMEC as well. This might not be very important for most people because people are willing to wait after a transplant, but it is important, especially for people who potentially are dependent on the eye in which you are operating. And potentially because pathology is bilateral, usually they have poor vision in the other eye as well. So this is pre-op of a patient with uh, pseudophagic bullous keropathy after cataract surgery, previously had Fuchs dystrophy. This is day one uh, where the air bubble is still partially present in the eye. And you'll see that the cornea is already starting to decharges. And in day three, the cornea is near normal compared to uh, what you would expect at the end of one month. And so the visual recovery is much faster as compared to any other surgery and people are seeing pretty well in about three to five days after the surgery. Refractive predictability is another reason why DMAX scores over DSEC, because if you look at the kind of incisions that we make for uh, DSEC surgery, especially by using injectors, the average incision size varies anywhere between three and 3.5 millimeters. And typically this can result in unpredictable astigmatism. If you compare that with DMAC, most incision sizes are less than three millimeters and you can even use a 2.2 millimeter incision. Wouldn't recommend that you do that right away to inject your DMEC tissue inside the eye. And this actually gives you the same kind of predictability as you would get with cataract surgery to a certain extent. So all of these reasons are reasons why DMEC potentially scores over DSEC. Now this is your next question and please help us with your responses as well. So what would be your primary reason to consider DMEC over DSEC, depending on what we just went through? Would you think it would be lesser risk of rejection and potentially the lesser uh, use of steroids and all the antecedent complications that come with using steroids for a longer duration? Potentially better visual quality, more predictable IOL powers, faster visual recovery after surgery, or the ability to be able to have a predictable refraction, including astigmatism after surgery because of the incision size. So again, please uh, pick up your devices or maybe access your computer screens and please help us answer this because uh, this again is uh, an important piece of information that uh, we would love to share with all of you. So, uh, here come the results and uh, most of you think that the uh, lesser risk of rejection is probably going to be the primary driving force why you would consider DMAC over DSEC and that's a very good reason in addition to better visual quality uh, and also refractive predictability as well. So thank you so much for those answers. Now let's dive into the second part of what we're going to be talking today and that is the differences in the surgical technique between DSEC and DMAC. And we'll look at these at each of the steps of the surgery from the perspective of a DSEC surgery. So the first difference actually is in donor preparation. So all of you know that there are several methods of preparing the donor tissue for DSEC surgery. You can use manual dissection, you can use a microkeratome, or you can use a femtosecond laser, not used so frequently now. Uh, but then uh, the wet method that you prepare a tissue is by dissecting the tissue manually into two planes or using a microkeratome into two planes and you try to achieve a donor tissue that's about 100 to 150 microns thick that you can inject inside the eye. Now, how do you prepare a DMEC graft? Well, in several uh, countries, especially like in the US, thanks to eye banks like SightLife um, and Cornea Gen, you have a pre-stripped tissue that is available for you to implant inside the eye. And in some cases also tissue that is uh, mounted inside a glass cannula that you can implant inside the eye and inject inside the eye, making it very similar to cataract surgery as well. So how do you actually prepare a tissue for DMAC surgery? There are a few things that are important to have. You don't need a very uh, complex set of instruments. 
You just need a set of trefines and you need a punching block. The red stars indicate that these are the bare minimum. The yellow stars indicate that these are the preferred instruments that you would have. So a vacuum punch that you can obtain from any supplier actually is one of the best methods or one of the best uh, instruments that you'll need for making or preparing a donor tissue. In addition to that, you also need a good pair of forceps. If you can access, there are forceps that have been made for holding or handling Desmase tissue. And uh, these are available from several companies. But then again, you don't need to have all of these. A simple jeweler's forceps or the suture tying forceps that you have with you on your table right now would be enough to actually strip tissue. So let's stop there. And uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen right now and move over to a video about preparing uh, donor tissues uh, for uh, DMEX surgery. So this uh, video is a minimally edited video uh, so that you will be able to see most of the nuances of how tissues are prepared. And there are captions in the middle of the video to point out the important steps and to make sure that you don't uh, miss some of the important pointers here. So uh, this is the donor punching block. This is a trifine uh, base that I'm using and I'm placing my corneal tissue with the epithelial side up on the trifine. Uh, then I'm just drying the epithelium and then placing a mark with a gentian wire ink pen. This is mainly a mark that will help me orient myself from the endothelial side and does not have any meaning beyond that. <clears throat> the first thing here is the fact that you need to ensure that your graft is well centered uh, around the area where the vacuum holes are present in your donor punching block. This is important to ensure that when you make your trephination, you don't overlap with the sterile spur or the trap meshwork. So I'm just double checking again to make sure that the distance is equal. And then when I put my trefine holder on, I also check and then I use a trefine that is a little larger. This is a 9.5 millimeter trefine. That's a really nice sharp trefine. So I put it down into the trefine holder, ensuring that my centration is good. And once I do that, I use a tapping motion to ensure that the uh, uh, desmase membrane and some part of the posterior stroma is inside. I wouldn't want to put, uh, punch it through and through. I just want the desmase to be cut. And following that, I use a little bit of trepan blue to ensure that I stain the edges of the uh, areas where endothelium has been lost by contact with the trifine. I try and remove most of the trepan blue and you'll notice here that there are several radial folds around those holes as well, which indicate that this is where the vacuum is present in the donor uh, punch. Then I spend some time trying to remove the peripheral desmase membrane. So what I'm trying to do here is scratch the peripheral desmase membrane so I can elevate it and remove it completely. And this is an insurance that you don't have any radial tears towards the center while peeling your desmase membrane. Next up, I use either a sharp chopper or any other special instrument to go in and try and elevate a small area of the desmase membrane. Preferably, you should do it in the area where the desmase is stained because it is less adherent in these areas. So once I'm able to elevate the desmase membrane, I try and do that for about one clock hour or so. And then I hold my desmase membrane with my forceps, typically a curved forceps, and I try to elevate a frill of desmase membrane all around to ensure that it is free of any additions to the stroma as well as to the peripheral desmase membrane. So this is actual speed, this is not sped up. So uh, this is how quickly you can go if the tissue is a little older. If you think that the tissue is from a younger donor, you probably have to go a little slower and ensure that you uh, have no additions with the stroma. The next thing I do is I release the vacuum that is holding my desmase and stroma back. And then I hold the edge of my desmase membrane and start to peel it towards the center. The amount that you want to peel can vary depending on the adherence, but typically I tend to do this in three tries. So I do a third, I ensure that I do go, go right till the center. And then I turn my trifine around and then I peel a second third. And then finally, I'll do a, another third after that to ensure that uh, I'm lifting my desmase membrane right up to the center of the cornea and ensuring that there are no attachments there. So this is the third part of my desmase being lifted up. You can actually see in the periphery, the earlier frills that have lifted up are actually standing up. 
<clears throat> After this is done, I ensure that I take off all the uh, fluid from the surface of the endothelium and the Desmase membrane. And then again, I try and center my trifine back in place. One quick pointer is to ensure that you don't have too much of a scleral frill because that can uh, impact centration. And uh, when you place your trifine holder in place, your tissue might get decentered. So ensure that you are aware of that and you don't allow any part of your trifine holder to touch the sclera. And once you have adequate centration, uh, then I will uh, ensure that uh, I put in my second trifine, which is about an eight millimeter trifine. And then I uh, ensure that uh, I uh, keep uh, touching and keep uh, uh, tapping on the surface so that I uh, get a uh, little incision on the Desmase membrane. And then I stain for the second time using Tripan Blue again to ensure that I know that I'm staining uh, the uh, inner part of where I've trifined again. Once I do that, I wash off all the Tripan Blue with uh, saline. And you can see that there's a frill of Desmase membrane, which we've handled earlier that I'm taking off. This is the part that we've handled. And so there is endothelial loss that is bound to happen there. So I remove that. And then I try and fold my Desmase membrane about 60, 40 as an overfold, and then ensure that I remove fluid from the opposite direction. And I ensure that my stromal bed is completely dry. Uh, and this is the, this, uh, the reason I'm doing this is to be able to punch a window using a three millimeter trifine so I can access the stromal part of my Desmase membrane later on. Once this is done, I ensure that there are no attachments between the uh, three millimeter stromal uh, button that I've created. And I put it back in place to ensure that uh, there is no leak out of the eye. And then I ensure that I put a little fluid to make the Desmase membrane go back and sit in the place that it came from and then dry the bed completely again to ensure that it is completely adherent to the back of the stroma. At this point of time, I turn my tissue around and then remove that stromal window, the three millimeter uh, punch that I've made. And then I go in and ensure that the Desmase membrane, the stromal part is completely dry. And then I use a, a marker. I mark an alphabet for obvious reasons. I use a P and uh, so that I can orient my tissue from inside uh, the cornea when I'm doing surgery. And then I place the three millimeter window back in place and uh, now my tissue is ready for uh, delivery inside the eye. So that's about the uh, technique for uh, uh, stripping the Desmase membrane and creating a donor. And uh, we'll go back into the next part of the presentation, uh, which is about the different uh, steps in uh, DMEC surgery, which are different from uh, DSEC other than donor preparation. But before we move on, one more question uh, again to understand uh, for those of you who are doing DMEC uh, surgery, do you have access to pre-stripped uh, DMEC tissue that is available to you from your local eye bank or maybe uh, from a friend who will strip DMEC tissue for you and uh, send it to you uh, so that you don't have to go through this process of stripping the Desmase membrane and preparing the graft before you do surgery? Uh, go ahead and please uh, answer this question again, because this is important to understand whether there is a likelihood of an increased learning curve to strip Desmase membranes to create your grafts and also potential for tissue damage when we are stripping the Desmase membrane as well. Uh, again, you don't need a very long learning curve to learn how to make your DMEC grafts. You'll probably need to uh, 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 prepare about five to 10 tissues, tissues that are not going to be used for surgery, and those will be good enough for you to become uh, an expert stripper of DMEC uh, tissues. So uh, go on and please answer whether you have access to uh, pre-stripped pre uh, DMEC tissue. In India, for the most part, we don't. Uh, we, most surgeons would like to prepare their own grafts. And so it is an extra investment of time, about 15 minutes extra for surgery. Uh, and most of us do it right before we operate. So we'll uh, go ahead and uh, display the results. Well, uh, well, the majority of you do not. So uh, would suggest uh, that uh, the end of the session and later on, we'll also share some YouTube links to uh, videos on how you can uh, strip Desmase tissue and learn how to prepare grafts. So very few of you have access to pre-strip DM, uh, DMAC tissue. Well, thank you for that. 
So moving on, the next step in the uh, host bed preparation is the stripping of the Desmase membrane. So typically for DSEC, you would like to strip the Desmase membrane and in some cases you don't even need to do that like post keratoplasty. But when you're stripping the Desmase membrane, what you would do is try to strip it in about an eight millimeter area so that you have some amount of overlap between your graft and your Desmase membrane so there are no bare areas that are left behind. First, from DSEC, because here you would want to uh, strip the Desmase membrane for as much as possible because you would uh, want to ensure that the peripheral Desmase uh, does not impact the adherence of your DMEC graft. So uh, this is what you would do in your typical DMAC case where you would like to ensure that the stripping is at least nine millimeters or more. So there is no overlap between your uh, DMAC graft and your uh, area that you strip your Desmase membrane. So that's one step that is different between DSEC and DMAC. The second step that is different is in the incisions. In DSEC, you typically would like to have longer incisions to ensure that your air does not leak out of the eye and your graft can overlap the internal lip of your incisions, both your uh, paracentesis in incisions as well as your main incision that you make to access the uh, anterior chamber in DSEC uh, surgery is usually a little longer than what you would normally make in cataract surgery because a little bit of an overlap between the graft and the incision is actually desirable to ensure that you have a hermetic seal of your incisions. Now look at the length of that incision in DC. So what I was saying was the area that uh, you would like to strip is generally larger and uh, the incisions in DSEC, as you can see in the video here, are typically a little longer than what you would make in DMEC surgery. Next slide, please. So uh, the main incision as well is, uh, is something that you would like to make longer than normal like in cataracts uh, as compared to cataract surgery in DSEC to have some overlap between your uh, tissue and your incision. Next slide, please. Uh, and if you compare that with uh, DMAC, uh, can you play the video, please? You'll actually see that in DMAC surgery, the size of your incisions is usually uh, a little smaller. The paracentesis are shorter because you don't want to have overlap between your graft and the internal lip of your incision. And the main incision that you make as well is usually a little shorter because you don't want your graft to again to overlap the internal lip because if you tap on that graft, it is possible that your graft might extrude uh, from the eye as well. So see the length of that incision is usually a little shorter. Thank you. Next slide, please. The other important thing about uh, the differences between the two kinds of surgery are the fact that you also will need to, uh, can we go to the next slide please? Yes. The fact that you will also have to uh, mark your graft. Well, like in DSEC in the early days when you used to uh, use to fold your graft like a taco and deliver it inside the eye, marking was mandatory because you would not know which side it would open up in. But nowadays in DSEC, the majority of surgeons don't mark their grafts. Next slide, please. So if you will uh, notice in DMEC surgery, like I showed you in the donor prep, uh, uh, the marking usually is quite mandatory. Next slide, please. So in uh, DMEC surgery, unless you mark your graft, uh, sometimes you actually can get confused by the uh, orientation of the alphabet inside the eye, especially if you're operating on corneas where visibility is not very good. And so it is really important to ensure that you have a mark and you also check that the mark is oriented correctly at the end of your surgery. Next slide, please. So, uh, we'll go on to the next slide. Great. So the next difference between DSEC and DMEC is also in loading the graft. The majority of uh, current techniques of loading and delivering the graft in DSEC involves some amount of either pulling or pushing the graft and uh, physically actually holding the graft. Uh, this is an example where uh, we're using uh, a sort of a bucin light to deliver the graft inside the eye. Next slide, please. 
So whereas in DMEC surgery, you do not use any physical contact between the graft and your uh, instrument that you're using to deliver the graft inside the eye. So the majority of uh, delivery techniques in DMEC will involve ensuring the graft is oriented correctly, and then also ensuring that you suck the graft in with a glass tube, so the graft is always bathed within fluid, and then you deliver the graft inside the eye along with fluid to ensure that it does not touch any part of the instruments that you're using to handle the graft inside the eye. Next slide, please. Next, yeah. So for uh, DSEC, there are any number of delivery devices that you can use to uh, insert the graft inside the eye. And uh, Dr. Gigan Gak will uh, also take you through some of the delivery devices for uh, DMEC surgery. Next slide, please. But for the majority of the DMEC surgeons, the default instrument to insert tissue inside the eye is a glass tube. You have different uh, uh, types of glass tubes. Uh, but then the reasoning behind this is the fact that you want minimal contact between your DMEC tissue and your, and your uh, uh, plastic in the periphery. And that's why most surgeons prefer to use a glass tube. Next slide, please. Uh, the other important difference between DMEC and DSEC is the manipulation of the graft inside the eye. Uh, next slide, please. In DSEC, most of the movement of the graft or the manipulation of the graft is done physically by actually holding onto the graft. Whereas in DMEC surgery, next slide, please. <clears throat> you will see that most manipulation occurs externally. So manipulation will end after you deliver your graft inside the eye and after you form your anterior chamber. And once this is done, most of your maneuvers are done externally rather than internally. So that's a change in, uh, in from the point of view of a surgeon who's used to doing DSEC. When you transition to DMEC, this is probably the single biggest learning that you will need to tap on the surface to get your graft to listen to you rather than uh, directly handle the graft and ensure that it opens inside the eye. Next slide, please. The last difference between uh, DMEC and DSEC from the surgical perspective is the attachment. In DSEC surgery, most surgeons are happy with a partial air bubble inside the anterior chamber. And this air bubble is good enough to actually achieve good centration as well as attachment, even if you have some fluid spaces between the graft and your host. Next slide, please. But unlike DSEC, DMEC is very different in this aspect. Uh, again, several surgeons use gas inside the eye instead of air. Uh, whereas, what, uh, next slide please. What we use is air and the difference is that the air bubble needs to completely fill the anterior chamber at the end of surgery because if it does not, premature absorption of the air can lead to detachment of the graft. Next slide please. Next slide please. So uh, we'll keep going on. Yes, the next slide actually is a, is a question for you again. If we'll move on to the next slide, please, Lawrence. Yes, uh, this is the uh, last question uh, that I had for all of you. And uh, again, would be interested in understanding uh, what would be the primary reason for the majority of you uh, not already transitioning to DMEC? Would it be because of limited access to tissue would it be because of uh, lack of instrumentation and availability of instrumentation? Uh, would it be because of the fact that most of your patients are not suitable for DMEC surgery? Uh, would it be because you're worried about visibility during surgery or uh, you're worried about graft manipulation and uh, unfolding? Uh, please again, uh, access your devices and help us uh, answer this question as well because uh, well, there you go. Uh, limited access to tissue seems to be the primary reason why most of you haven't transitioned to DMEC, and that's certainly something uh, that uh, can be addressed. Graft manipulation and unfolding, hopefully after you listen to Dr. Gigengak's talk next, you'll probably become pros at uh, doing this as well. Thank you for the question. We'll move on to the next slide. Well, to end uh, what I've been talking to you about so far uh, is revisiting all the reasons why DMEC 
is probably a surgery that you should look to transitioning to at least in a few cases over DSEC because it does have its advantages. Next slide, please. All of us go through a learning curve and on an average, it seems that it takes about 10 uh, cases. We can keep going, clicking through this slide to ensure that uh, uh, it takes about 10 cases or so to make you comfortable with the different uh, steps in DMAX surgery. So on an average of mentor cases or 10 cases, if you have exposure to pretty certain will become a very good DMAX surgery. Next slide, please. So what I would like to leave you with today, next slide, please, is the fact that uh, the, you don't need to do DMAC in all your patients, where there are still some cases where you should still do DSEC, and that would include patients where visibility is really poor and anybody would struggle to do a DMAC surgery, where you have patient comorbidities, where the patient cannot lie flat for a long time, extensive peripheral anterior sinicae like an ice syndrome or in certain conditions where maybe the IOL is unstable. If you have a very poor posterior graft hose junction like post PK again, uh, DMEC is not a good choice in cases like that. And again, the most important thing that I've learned over time is do not try to do DMEC in an eye where it potentially may not make a difference to the patient because DMEC has specific indications where it can potentially impact visual equity, but in cases where visual equity is going to be limited, then doing DMEC over DSEC might not be of any advantage. So thank you very much for your uh, patient hearing and for answering all the questions and uh, apologize for uh, the slides going off somewhere in the middle. Uh, hopefully I'll be able to answer questions while Dr. Gigandiak is speaking. Uh, so would like to uh, invite uh, Matt to uh, go on and teach us all about uh, handling the DMEC tissue inside the eye. Over to you, Matt. Thanks, Praveen. Thanks, uh, Samara. Thanks, SightLife, for having me. Um, I'll, I'll move on from here. There's a little bit of overlap in what we're talking about, and I'll try to skip over the stuff that um, Praveen already answered expertly. Um, I'm medical director for Cornea Gen. I put that on my disclosure. Um, one, one, one of the things I noticed on the, on the questions was that a lot of you are people that are not yet, or surgeons that are not yet doing DMEC surgery. And, and, um, and I, wanna, I want this talk to be encouraging to have you go out and try it. And, and because, it, because of all the reasons that uh, Praveen was saying that it's the right thing to do for your patients. And, and, um, and then I, I, this slide here, I wanted, I, I think DMEC surgery is a lot like cataract surgery um, and that there's a, there's more than one right way to do it, um, and as you and that's kind of daunting if you get on the internet and you start looking up ways of how to do um, DMAC for your patients, and you see some guys like to do it this way and some guys like to do it that way. Um, that that's true. There there there's more than one way to do it, but you shouldn't try to learn every way at once. You don't want to go into that first DMAC surgery thinking, well, there's ten different ways that I could do this. You want to go into it saying. The, after I did my research and preparation, I'm going to try to do it this way. I'm going to try to do it this one way. And, and today I'm going to present um, my way of doing it. And, and maybe that will ring to you. And maybe that would be the one that you might go off and, and, uh, and try when you try it yourself. Or maybe you'll pick a different one, but pick one, don't pick them all. And then just like Praveen was saying, don't start off with complex cases. Like just like you wouldn't with a cataract surgery, you wouldn't start off with the worst cataract. You'd start off with one that was manageable. And then, and then know that, um, that not all cataract surgeries are the same, also not all DMEX surgeries are the same, so be prepared for some variability in the way your, your patients respond to what you're doing. Um, so this, this is probably a little bit redundant, but it's a, it's a poll question. Um, you guys can answer that, and I think we'll, it'll, it'll probably give us a little similarity to the first question that uh, Praveen um, uh, gave us. So again, most, most of you are, are, are folks that aren't doing a lot of DMEC yet and want to do more. And I think um, I'm hoping that my, my um, technique talk that I'm going to give will be helpful for that. Um, th this is just, uh, I, I kind of wrote out every single step that I do in DMEC. And that's kind of daunting when you look at that and you're thinking about picking up a new surgery because there's 22 steps or so in there. But then I, I pulled out the ones that are different uh, between DSEC and DMEC. So if you're a DSEC surgeon, you pretty much already know how to do a lot of DMEC. 
and there's only a few different things different that you have to do. Um, preparing the donor, which uh, Praveen already went over, is a, is, a, is a scary one, and unfolding the donor is a scary one, so I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about how you unfold the donor. Um, and then those other ones that I, I put over there on that second column are things that I do differently on DMACC than DSEC, but they're not anything that um, anterior segment surgeons have trouble doing, or they're not things that are novel to us, so I won't spend too much time on that. Um, just really quickly, when, when, when you do a DMAC surgery versus a DSEC surgery, usually you're leaving more air or gas in the eye at the end of the surgery, and the, and the risk of pupillary block is, is higher. And so um, when I do a DSEC surgery, I don't make a PI, a peripheral iridotomy, but when I do a DMAC surgery, since I'm leaving more, in my case, SF6 gas in there, I make an inferior PI. And so that's a different step than DSEC, and, and, um, and it's an important one because um, you can hurt people with pupillary block. You know, if, if a DMEC fails because uh, you didn't put too, enough air in there, or if it detaches, you can go back and fix it. But if they, if they get pupillary block, that's a potentially blinding condition. So that PI is important. And um, as you're doing a new surgery, anything you can do before the day of the surgery and making the day of the surgery easier is better. And so if you have access to a, a YAG laser doing a, a, a PI with a YAG laser maybe a couple days before uh, can be good. If not, a vitrector is a really good way of doing it. And if not, then I, then I use a needle. And I have a video on how to do that. I'm going to skip that because I want to, I could come back and show it later, but you guys know how to make a PI. Um, so so um, here's a question for you. If you, if you are doing DMEC, um, which, what method are you using for injecting the tissue? The, the, most folks that are doing it are using that IOL injector, and that makes sense because it's, it's um, inexpensive. There, there's some advantages to the glass cannulas, and, um, and, and what I like to use is the goiter cannula, which I'll talk about. I, I realize, too, that in the, in the USA, we're spoiled sometimes in the, in the um, disposables and things that we can use. Um, there, there are people that are reusing those glass cannulas, which, which I think makes them uh, comparable in cost to the IOL injector, but, but I get that. So um, just, the, just the, know that there's more than one method for injecting the tissue, and, 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 I, and they all have their advantages. I think the advantage of the IOL injectors is that they're inexpensive, and you, and you probably already have one. Um, and then most people in the United States are using um, glass cannulas, which um, have the advantage that you can see through them and see the tissue in there, and then the glass is thought to be more um, gentle on the tissue. Um, and then the one that, that I've settled on is the, is the goiter cannula, which I like more than the, than the Jones tube um, for a few different reasons. You know, it, um, I get my tissue preloaded now, um, again, spoiled, um, but I used to have to um, strip it briefly until they started to do that for me. And then I used to have to load it into the, the cannula and now I get it preloaded into the cannula. Um, but even if you get your tissue preloaded, you want to know how to load it in case it ever comes, comes, un, comes out. And, and what I like about the goiter cannula is that if you're looking at the picture of it there, there's a skinny end and a, and a fat end. And um, unlike the Jones tube where you, where you load the tissue and in, inject the tissue through the same end, with the goiter cannula, you, you um, load the tissue into the fat end and then inject it into the into the eye through the skinny end, and that allows you to gently load the tissue uh, without squishing it. And then it also allows you to um, put it into a small incision on the cornea. So that, that's, that's the one advantage of that, loading it in this end and then injecting it out of that end. And then I like the glass, because so, some people will say you can look at inside a glass cannula and see how the tissue's oriented and sort of twist it so that you are shooting it in with the proper orientation. That's hard to do because sometimes it sort of spirals as it comes out, but it's a, it's a neat trick to try. Um, the, the goiter cannula, um, this fat end is designed to screw into a, into a syringe nicely, um, and, it's, and it seems to do that reliably every time. Um, and then it can go through it. They say it can even go through a 2-2 incision. I put it through a 2-4 incision because that's what I use normally for my cataracts. And then I like the length of the skinny part because, and the bevel, because you can, when you put it in there, you can get it past the pupil so you don't have fear of injecting it through the pupil. 
and and because it's tapered, it fits it fits the wound uh, snugly. Here's a here's a video of me assembling the thing. So that's the five cc syringe that I put a few a few uh, cc's of, of uh, balanced salt in, and it comes with it comes with the tubing. If you are reusing the glass thing, which of course the company doesn't recommend, but I know people do it. Um, you could use you could you could use uh, just IV tubing for that, and then you then you put some fluid through it so that it's it doesn't have a big air bubble in it. And this video came from when I was getting my tissue already stripped, um, but not loaded. So it's in this uh, Optisol here, all stripped and stained. Praveen fixed it for me, um, and then uh, um, then you can you can aspirate it through the fat end of that without, without squishing it at all. And of course that's got a bunch of Optisol in it. So what I'm going to do is drop it into um, a, a thing of BSS. Now, if you were stripping your own tissue, you would just uh, stain it and then put it in a, in a, a medicine cup with some saline in it, sterile saline, and then, and then aspirate it into the um, fat end of that goiter tube. There it is inside the tube, and then you got to gently remove the um, the tubing off, and then I'm going to screw the syringe into the back end. There's a little air bubble usually on the back end of it, so you want to you want to drip a little fluid right. I'm going to drip a couple drops in there to get rid of that little air bubble, and then screw that on there, and you don't have an air bubble in there, and that thing's ready to ready to inject. Very easy to do; doesn't take long. You can see it in there. You can kind of see how it's oriented already. Okay. And then the injection, um, like like most uh, tools that you put in the eye, the the it has a bevel on it, and you go and bevel down. But before you inject it, you uh, turn it to bevel up. That's stopping for some reason. Let's see if that works. So you get it just past the pupil, and then you turn it bevel up. And then you know you're not going to inject it into the pupil, because it goes to a two-four wound. You can you can kind of just pull the cannula back out without worrying about it uh, refluxing out, which used to be a problem with the bigger injectors. And there's some tricks to that, and I'll talk about that. But it's a it's a pretty straightforward uh, injection method. All right, so we so we got the tissue in the eye, and now we're going to talk about um, the unfolding of the tissue. Um, which is which is the part of the surgery that most people get the most nervous about, and and, and when I'm teaching it to folks, I I um, I, I kind of give some some cheerleading things at the beginning. I say it's not that hard. It's different than anything that you've done in other surgeries, but but it but it isn't that hard. And you can do it, and then I always remind people if you mess it up, you could always repeat the transplant. So you want to in your in your worry to get it unfolding, you want to not do damage to the eye because you're getting frustrated or know that um, in the worst case scenario that you couldn't get the thing unfolded, you could, you could uh, come back another day and try again. I know uh, tissue is uh, short in lots of places, but first do no harm. And then the other thing that I, I tell, you know, our patients are awake and they're listening to us. And in the beginning, especially, I would tell my patients, hey, there's this funny st step in this surgery where I'm going to be unfolding this thing. And sometimes it unfolds really quickly in a couple of minutes. And sometimes it takes longer than that. And if you hear me messing around talking about that, that doesn't mean anything's going wrong. I also usually have a fellow sitting next to me and, and I, I warn them that the fellow might be saying things like, is that upside down? Or is that, you know, if they know, to, if they know that those are normal things to be saying, then it doesn't make them nervous. And then, and then take your time when you're doing this unfolding. And, and with all things that are tricky or complicated, it, it helps to um, sort of simplify, simplify it. And, um, the first thing I do after injecting the tissue in the eye is I, is I flatten the anterior chamber. And I'll tell you that when you do that, the tissue will assume one of uh, several shapes that will become familiar to you the more of them that you do. And then once, it's, once, once I've done that, I know that there are three different things that I can do to get this tissue unfolded and appropriately positioned. I can, I can deepen the chamber if I want the graft to move around a little bit more. I can flatten the chamber if I want the graft to move around less. If I have it in the right spot and I want it to move less, I can flatten the chamber. And then you can tap on the outside of the cornea. And when you tap on the outside of the cornea, it makes a fluid wave in the eye. 
And, and a thing to always remind yourself while you're doing this is it's the fluid wave that unfolds the graft. It's not your instrument. You're not pushing on it with your instrument. You're causing this wave to go through the anterior chamber and that's what un unfolds the graft. And then um, again, just like, just like with, with I was saying in the beginning, there's more than one ways to do this, but you wanna have a go-to technique. And I have these four moves. I tried to, to um, simplify what I do into four different moves that I use for unfolding almost every DMEC that I use and, and um, that I do. And, and again, there might be more than one way to do this, but I'm gonna go over these four moves because I think you can unfold um, almost any DMEC using these moves. Um, just a couple things before I go on to show some videos. Um, if it's unfolding funny, if you, if you um, flatten the chamber and the shape that the graph took doesn't look like one of the ones that you know how to unfold, uh, just deepen the chamber and flatten it again because you'll get a different, it'll, it'll form slightly different shape and maybe it's one that you recognize that you can, that, that you can do. So, so sort of flatten the chamber, look at the shape, analyze it. If you don't like it, deepen the chamber and flatten it again. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll go over a couple of shapes that I don't like to see um, and I have a picture of them. Um, I'll talk about orientation in a little bit. If there's air bubbles in the anterior chamber, maybe someone in with your, when you injected the tissue, they get in the way of the unfolding. So go in there with the cannula and remove them. Um, once that graph's totally unfolded, it's hard to move around the anterior chamber. So you wanna have it centered before you completely unfold it. And then sometimes it'll get sort of stuck in the angle. So if, you, if you're trying to move it around and it's not moving, maybe it's stuck in the angle, deep in the chamber and get it out of that area. So the initial shapes. So when I, when I put the graft in and I flatten the chamber, I look at the shapes that it's forming and, I, and usually it's one of these two shapes. Either the bottom one I would call uh, the, this one I, they call the Goldilocks scroll where, where two ends are sort of curving in. And then this one we might call a, a sort of a taco fold. And, and it, it invariably it forms one of these two shapes and, and, and you can look at it and you can, it's hard to tell if it's upside up or upside down. This is sort of a side view. It could be like that or like that. And this one could be those two orientations. But um, things that I, that I try to avoid um, that I would cause me to deepen the chamber and flatten it again is if I flattened it and it looked exactly folded in half, the ones that are exactly folded in half with the techniques that I like to use, don't don't um, don't unfold as well. So um, if I see that, I'll deepen it and flatten it again to get it back to one of those two shapes that I showed above. And then I, this other one I call a double fold. It, it this one's sort of a sneaky one because it looks like it's almost there, and you're like, oh, I can totally do that. Um, but the second fold on it locks it, and and if you see that second fold, that's not going to unfold for you with the techniques that I like to use. So I deepen it and get that second fold to, to go away. This is an Escher painting, you know, that knowing if it's, a, if it's upside up or upside down uh, is sort of an optical illusion and it's trickier than you think. And you gotta have some way of determining whether it's upside up or upside down. We know that the graph uh, scrolls with the endothelium on the outside and, um, and the mark that you put on your graph, the P that uh, Praveen put on there, there's some other marks that I like to use. Um, is essential for for knowing upside up or upside down, but sometimes that mark will fade, and you got to have a you got to have a backup plan if your mark is invisible, and and a good way of doing it is it's sitting there in the anterior chamber is to put a cannula along the graft and and move it out to the periphery, and if you go under the edge of it, then you know it's curled appropriately uh, up, and if you and if you go along and you don't like in this area, if you slide it along, you don't go under the edge of it, then you know it's curled the other way. So it's a way of figuring out the orientation without putting a mark on it. Um, and moving to my next question, those of you that are doing it, what do you, what do you like as your mark? I should have had a P mark. I think if you use a P mark, you could, you could click that you like the S mark. Uh, S for stroma, Praveen. I guess P for Praveen is better, but uh, um, let's see what people say. The II is a one-two mark, which I've which I've sort of switched to. I'll talk about. Okay. Good. So um, here's here's a, a couple of shots from my I bank. One with the one with the S mark and one with this one-two mark. 
I kind of like the one, two mark now. Most of my videos have the S mark in them because I made them before I switched to the one, two mark. The one, the one, two mark, if you're, if you're stripping your own tissue, I think maybe is a little bit easier to put on because you don't have to do that punch, but I would defer to Praveen on that because I don't have to strip my own tissue. But if you put a one, two mark like that, we're looking at it endothelial side facing us right now so that when you put it in the eye the other way, the one and the two will be in clockwise orientation, like, like uh, you know, like one and then two, like you'd see it on the clock. Whereas the S looks like an S for, I think of an S for stroma when I was doing DSEC, but I, the S should look like a normal S when the thing's in the right orientation. Um, the neat thing about the one, two mark too, is that it's on the edge of the graft. And sometimes when you're starting to unfold it, the edge of the graft becomes visible before the middle of the graft. And so you, you get your idea of your orientation a little bit quicker. The other thing about the one, two mark that I like a little better is that sometimes, you know, six months after the surgery, you can still see the S in the patient's eye. And since the S ends up being sort of paracentral, um, maybe that has some effect on the vision. I think it really does. I don't think it matters, but, but you can see it for a while afterwards. The one, two, since it's on the periphery, maybe matters less. All right, the flip. So, um, so you put it in the eye, you flattened it, you start to unfold it and you realize you're upside down. You need to have a way of turning it over and um, we'll call this move the flip and, and you go in with a cannula through your paracentesis and you inject it and you ricochet it off of the iris and it makes a sort of a, a circular um, current in the anterior chamber and it'll turn it over. Here's one here. Um, that um, it looks like it's in a Goldilocks scroll. I, I feel like I'm, I'm gonna be all done in just a minute. And as I start to unfold it, I see that this S here is backwards S. But hopefully you can see that on the video. It's a backwards S and then I realize, hey, I'm, uh, I'm unfolding it upside down. And so I'm gonna go in through the paracentesis and inject some fluid. And, and you can't really tell from a 2D video here, but I'm injecting and I'm bouncing it off the iris and it makes a, a, a current in the anterior chamber and it turns it over nicely. And here I am back in that uh, Goldilocks scroll, but in the other orientation, ready to flatten and then roll it. Um, the cha-cha, the so you, you need to have some sort of a method for centering it. And this, this diagram is not, not my, my best artwork, but um, you, you have two cannulas and, you, and you, tap, you, you tap the surface of the cornea with one, one cannula and it makes a fluid wave. And then if you just tap it and let go, it'll, the, the graft will move over and then drift right back again as the fluid comes back. So you tap it with one and then you pin it there with the other and then you kind of alternate and you can kind of shimmy this thing forward. And so, so when, I, when I'm unfolding things, I, I use this cha-cha technique to center it. The, the Goldilocks, um, if you get that Goldilocks orientation of your graft and it looks like this, this, these are the easiest ones to open. You just tap on the surface with a cannula and it makes this fluid wave that causes the two edges to flip out. So this first video here is gonna show you a combination of a Goldilocks and a cha-cha. <laughs> so, um, so I flattened the chamber, it formed that nice Goldilocks scroll. I'm tapping in the middle and it's starting to unfold. And I don't want to get it all the way unfolded until I have it centered right. So there it's, there it's almost unfolded. Um, and then I'm going to cha-cha it over because I want it right centered on my mark. That was the cha-cha and then a little, a little bit more to unfold there. And you can see that frontwards S. And then um, I'll squirt some gas in here, but I'm going to... Um, a little air and you're done. So there's this other move called the derisomer. Now, now the shape that they, everybody shows on their video is always that Goldilocks scroll, but, but, but the one that happens more often is this one that's the taco where it's uh, folded more like this. Um, and if you wanna do a unfold this one, you do this move called the derisomer where you take one cannula and you pin this edge and with the other cannula, you tap next to it, not on, not on top of the folded part, but right next to it. And it makes a fluid wave and it causes it to open up. So this is going to be a, a combination of the cha-cha and the derisomer. So I got the, I flattened it and I got that kind of taco fold and I pinned it with the left hand 
and I'm tapping it with the right and it starts to open up and I got to center it before it gets all the way open and cha-cha, cha-cha. And then tap, 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 derisimer. It's, it's, it's not uh, staying the way I want it, so I'm flattening the chamber a little bit to get, to get it to be more, to, less mobile. So that's that, I can flatten, I can deepen, or I can tap. Then a little, little cha-cha to get it in the right spot. There it is. And we like it. And then we'll put uh, gas in there. All done. Then, uh, um, and really, that I'll talk about some some different things that can happen. But th those are the those are the techniques that I use to unfold almost every graft. Um, and uh, and there there are things that can go wrong, just like with any other surgery. And you want to know about them, and you want to know what you can do to avoid them. So I'll go over some of the more common ones. Um, injection errors. Most of the injection errors that happen, I think, get minimized by using the scoiter cannula. But I'm biased. Um, here's a here's a uh, a mishap. This is using a Jones tube. The Jones tube used to go through a 3.2 millimeter wound and you can have a lot of, of uh, uh, reflux of fluid out that wound and there, there it goes. And so even if you get preloaded tissue, you got to know how to reload it again if something like that happens, which is what you would do if that happened. There's, there's ways to avoid that. The goiter cannula goes through a smaller wound so you get less of a fluid out. But the other thing you can do is after you inject it, remember you put a bunch of fluid into the eye and you want to decompress that pressure a little bit. So go while the while the injector is still in the, the eye, you can take your cannula and decompress the chamber through the paracentesis, and that takes a little bit of the pressure off. The other thing you can do is to try to turn the graft sideways so it's less like so it's not lined up to launch out like that. Um, here's another thing that can happen that I think the goiter cannula helps with. Um, the uh, the Jones tube didn't go very far into the eye, and if you angled it down, you could shoot it. Um, you could shoot the graft into the pupil, um, and that's a that's a, a tricky thing if that happens. If it happened, you would go in there and and just uh, grab it and pull it back out. But that that's uh, poor style points, and and the, and the graft is really friable. So if you grab it like that, you could tear it. Um, what I like about again, what I like about the goiter is that. Um, is that uh, because it's a small wound, you're less likely to have um, the fluid come back out. And then because of the way it's longer, you can get it past the pupil before you inject it. And then a neat thing you can do if you're worried about it is you can kind of turn it uh, sideways so that, um, so that it won't come shooting back out. Just a, just a thing about the injecting air after you get the tissue in the appropriate position you're going to inject the air the the your cannula is small and if you um and sometimes when you um are squirting air out uh there'll be you know you get the there's a little surface tension on the air cannula and when you start the air going sometimes it takes a lot of force to get it to go so i like to do that outside the eye but it'll it'll hiss air for a little while after you do that and you just want to make sure it's done hissing before you put it in the eye because sometimes just like that a, a little bit of air will go shooting back in and you'll have just spent your you just sweat it out unfolding the thing and then you squirt that air in there and it and it, you have to start over a little bit and that's that's a particularly demoralizing um this uh this little video here on the left here this is a four different dmec graphs that i was playing around with in the eye bank and i, I just wanted to show you how they're very different these these two look like they're ready to just just go in the eye just nicely and then this one up here do you guys see that one is this really tight scroll um and sometimes you'll get one of those really tight scrolls sometimes you'll get the goldilocks like the one i'm circling there and then you get these two that are making that that taco shape and a good a good tool to have in your in your in your toolbox is this fogla cannula that shoots fluid out the sides of it and, and I use that if I ever get one of those tight scrolls, which doesn't happen that often. But here I am going to use a, a, the Fogla cannula to open one of these tight scrolls. This one's not even the tightest, but I line it up. I line the tight scroll up with my, one of my paracentesis. And then I go in there with the Fogla cannula that, that um, shoots uh, 
fluid out the side and then opens it. And then there's my shape that I know about. There's that, that taco fold and I know what to do with that. I can do a, a derisimer and a cha-cha to get that thing going. So it, um, so that's, that's a technique for getting that, that tight scroll to turn into one of the shapes that you're familiar with. Um, graph tearing. Um, again, I don't have to prep my tissue anymore. They used to give it to me um, uh, pre-strip, but then laid back on the stroma. But I would imagine when you guys are learning how to um, prepare this tissue that you might ever tear it. And there's one that tore. And the point being, you, this, is a, this is a patient of mine where I tore the graft and I put the bigger piece of it in there. And this is a, a month post-op and it looks great. Um, and, and this picture down here is a picture from a paper by Garrett Mellis out there where he was doing hemi-DMEX, where he, where he cut the tissue in half and used one donor for two patients. And then, of course, you know that some of us out there are doing this decime stripping only now, where, where in certain patients you can just take off decimes and not even put a graft in. So um, the, the point being is that your, your donor tissue doesn't have to be it full. And if you ever had tear one and you, if you have a big enough piece, you could put it in and maybe still get it to work, probably still get it to work. It might, it might delay the recovery time because the area that you stripped that wasn't covered takes a little while to heal. Fiber and formation is a bad thing that can happen. Um, doesn't happen very often, but something about the tapping brings out uh, inflammatory mediators from the iris and maybe the PI has something to do with that too. And sometimes you'll get this fiber forming in the anterior chamber particularly if you took a long time to unfold it. And um, it's a really hard complication to get by. It's, it's more better to avoid it than deal with it when it happens. If it happens, just try to get your graft unfolded quickly and know that you might be redoing that case somewhere down the road. And, and, and people that form fibrin are more likely to form it again. And those folks, you might think about doing a DSEC if you had to repeat it. But ways to minimize the chances of it are to make your PI beforehand the other thing I do is I sort of leave the eye at a high pressure after I get the eye ready for its, uh, the DMAC while I'm preparing the DMAC. And I think having it at a high pressure makes the fibrin formation less likely, but it, it's pretty rare. Um, I, I have some talk about post-op management. I'm, I'm, we're going over time a little bit. I'm thinking, uh, Praveen, what if, what if we made this a talk about uh, unfolding and, and what we've done so far and answered some questions now and know that people are going to have to look up their their post-op management. Um, there, there is some stuff to think about in post-op management, like when do you uh, rebubble, which is sort of what I was going to go into. And I don't mind doing that if we decided that was how best to use this time. What do you think, Praveen? You can unmute and tell me what you... Uh, I think this bit is important. Maybe we should spend a few minutes talking about post-op management. Okay. So I should just flip through these slides. Okay. Um, so, um, so, so the graft is in there, you put the gas bubble in there, you're done. Um, and, and different people have different sort of regimens that they do for folks um, after they do that. Um, DSEX, I usually tell my DSEC patients that, that maybe there would be a dislocation of their graph, maybe one in 50, the way that I do it. And with, with, a, with a DMEC, um, I, I tell folks that there's about, with my technique, there's about a one in eight chance that, that maybe there'd be some dislocation of the graft afterwards and need to have something done. When, when, a, when a DMEC um, detaches, different than a DSEC, it usually only partially detaches. So when a, when a DSEC detaches, the whole thing might come off. But when a DMEC detaches, usually it's just one portion of the graph that has some space. And, and, um, and of course, one in eight isn't all that high, but we'd like to avoid it entirely. Um, and, and the way that you minimize the, the detachments is, you, is positioning. And then, and then air stays in the eye for a couple of days and SF6 stays in the eye for the better part of a week. And so if you have access to SF6, that can, that can minimize or lower your rates of, um, of detachment, though I don't feel strongly about that. I think air works real well too. But for my patients, I use 20% SF6 uh, to hold the graft in place. And, and I have them lie flat for an hour after the surgery with their head taped in just the position that I want them to be in. 
And then I have them go home and I tell them to maintain that lying flat position as much as possible um, until they see me the next day, maybe take a 15 minute break every two hours. I'm always a little bit worried about um, pupillary block. So I tell them if they were to get a really bad headache, I'd want them to sit up a little bit because the gas bubble would move and that inferior PI that I would make would, would lower the pressure. And they don't usually have to do that with the amount of gas that I leave in there. Um, about an 80% anterior chamber fill at physiologic pressure is what I like to do. But so they lie flat until they see me the next day and then I check them. And then I usually see them a few days later and I tell them to try to lie flat for, for two or three more days with 30 minute breaks every couple of hours. And that's hard for some patients, um, but, the, but the, since the gas bubble's in there, um, it helps to do that. Um, we'll talk more about that. The, um, antibiotics, obviously we use some Vigamox drops or moxifloxacin drops and then steroids. Um, uh, you know, we talked about how there's less rejection in DMEC. I, I put them on uh, steroid, steroid drops four times a day initially, and I, and I get down to once a day over the course of about four months, and then I stay on it once a day um, indefinitely if there's no reason not to. There's some data out there that shows once a day steroid drops lowers the risk of rejection in DMEC from, from 2% to 1%. And then we're going to talk a little bit about rebubbling. Um, so if, if, they, if they come in to see you in the first week or two and there's an area of the graft that isn't adherent and you can tell that it isn't adherent because there's some edema overlying that area, then you're gonna ask yourself, should you put a little bit more air bubble in there back in the office or, or in your minor room? And, and there's some rules that I follow um, because a lot of those detachments kind of resolve themselves as, as the endothelium starts to wake up. but 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 here's, here's some rules that I follow. If the, if the area of detachment is greater than a third of the entire graft, then I usually rebubble. And then even if it isn't greater than a third of the graft, but the area of detachment is involving the visual axis, uh, then I rebubble because it gets them better quicker. Know that if you need to rebubble, uh, it isn't an emergency. That you usually have, a, you have about a six week window, I think, to, to do a rebubble. Um, sooner rather than later if you think you need it just because it gets the patient to the finish line faster. But, um, but after about six weeks, that, that tissue starts to get kind of fibrotic and it won't go up into its, its place. So if you think you need to do it, uh, know that you got that window to do it in. And you can do it more than once. Um, I used to do it once and if it wasn't working, I thought I had bad tissue. Um, but, I've, but I've seen that some of them need to re be rebubbled again. And sometimes it needs to be rebubbled, not because anything that the patient did wrong or anything that you did wrong. If you think about it, the, um, the, a, a swollen cornea has a different curvature than an unswollen cornea. And, and you'll see it happen sometimes that on day one, they look great. And somewhere in that first week, they, there starts to be a little area of detachment. And I think it happens because as that corneal edema goes away, the curvature changes and it makes a little bit of space. And I see it happen more often in those eyes that were very swollen to start with because there's probably more of that curvature change. Here's a picture that you don't see very often in DMEC where, where the graft is entirely detached and it's scrolled up in the anterior chamber. And that probably means, it could mean that you put it in upside down. That could, that could be a reason for complete detachment or maybe there's something wrong with the tissue or maybe, or maybe something else. But um, some people will squirt vision blue in the eye and restain that thing and try to put it back. If I see something like this happen, I usually take it out and do another one, again, because I'm spoiled and I have good access to tissue, but it doesn't happen very often in DMEC. Partial detachments are more uh, the norm. Um, here's one where you see this area of edema that um, where there's a detachment, you can see it on the OCT. And, and I would say that's more than a third of the graft and also involving the visual axis. And that's one that I would think about rebubbling. Um, and I would do that in the, in the clinic. I would, um, I would look at the graft and I'd pick an area where it was detached and I would make a little mark on the um, limbus where I wanted to go in with the air. And then I like to do it with them lying flat when I inject it, though you can do it with them sitting up at the slit lamp. I know some people do that. But I injected an area away from the detachment so that I won't worsen the detachment by the injection. Here's one that's a third of the graft and one that I rebubbled. This one, I just like this picture because this, this graft was 
a failed DSEC that I did a DMEC on top of, and you'll see them detach sometimes at the edge of the scar tissue where the DSEC was. And this one detached uh, on either side and sort of started to scroll up. And for whatever reason, uh, the patient didn't want me to rebubble, and they did fine. And because the graft covered the pupil and the edges eventually healed, and 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 uh, you'd be surprised at how many of these will resolve themselves even with doing nothing, especially small detachments. So if you had like a 10% detachment, you might, you might not do anything. Just another, another one with a detachment. Pupillary block, I won't, I won't talk much about just to say that it's uh, to be avoided. I would rather put less gas in and need to do more rebubbles than put too much gas in and never have to do a rebubble, but have an occasional pupillary block. Sometimes you'll see uh, patients afterwards where everything looks great. This is a DMEC I did and he's not dilated. It's because I probably put too much gas in there and he probably had a high pressure uh, in that first day or two and damage to the pupillary sphincter and some permanent medriasis that to be avoided. That's a, uh, Praveen, you could add to that section if you wanted to, I kind of blitzed through that. No, I think that's a uh... Great, Matt. I think you've uh, covered what would normally be spoken over a two-day course in uh, 30, 35 minutes. So I think a uh, great job. Uh, I think some of the questions that were coming in uh, in the chat and uh, potentially uh, were related to positioning and uh, also to rebubbling. And that's the reason why I thought that uh, would be good to cover. Uh, the, the other questions uh, uh, were about why you prefer to uh, tap on the eye and not use fluid jets inside the eye. Uh, so would you like to uh, answer that as well? Sure. Um, so it, it's, a, it, it's, it's counterintuitive the way that graft unfolds. And, and um, I remember the first couple I did, I, I thought, well, I'll just it wasn't unfolded, so I thought I would just go in there with an instrument and, and sort of pin it with one and unroll it with the other, and of course I tore it. Um, and so, so you, can't, you can't drag it around the inside of an eye like you would with the DSEC. And then, um, and the fluid jets, to, to move it around the eye with fluid jets through your paracentesis, it's just, it's, it's too much of a wave. It kind of would just jam it over into the, into the angle. The, the wave that you get when you tap on the corneal surface is, is a tiny little fluid shift in the eye, and it's enough to 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 cause it to unfold without cause it to to shoot off to the side of the eye. Basically, it's 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 more. It looks less delicate, but it's more delicate, I think, to what it's doing to the graft. I don't know if that if you agree with that, Praveen. Yeah, but I think the other question was about uh, the sign to reassure us that the DMEC orientation is correct. Like in DSEC, you talk about the double ring sign. So is there any sign uh, that tells you? Uh, I'm, I'm assuming that if we don't have a mark on the graph, that the graph is oriented correctly. Um, there isn't, I don't think. I mean, it, it, it can look very normal upside down. And it, that's why that mark is essential. Um, not essential because you because if you if the marks faded you can still do it but but you have to um you have to know it's unfolding right before you get it all the way unfolded if you don't have the mark on it um uh it, it looks identical upside down as upside up unless you have some sort of an orientation mark do you agree with that yes absolutely i think uh, that's why marking is so crucial and I think that sort of is a game changer, especially if you're operating in eyes where visibility is not very good. Uh, and one other, one other uh, crucial, I think, learning is when you're transitioning from DMEC to DSEC, typically we tend to pick cases that would be more challenging uh, because you are worried about the outcome. You probably don't want to try this technique in an eye that has a very clear cornea. But again, counterintuitively, it's really important to pick a cornea or a case where the visibility is good, the anterior chamber is normal, and the likelihood of you having a good outcome is higher. Those are the easiest cases. And typically, uh, for somebody who's transitioning again, a previously failed DSEC graft is actually a very good case to start with. Because you have a patient where the vision is not very good, and once you take the DSEC off, visibility is usually pretty good. And uh, the anatomy, I'm assuming, of the anterior chamber should be uh, conducive for you to do a DMEC as well. So 
the reason I said that was because unless you're doing a case in a cornea that is really clear, which is very unlikely, marking the graft, I think, is very important to ensure, at least in your first, I would say, 100 cases, to ensure that you've got the graft right. Even after, if your uh, edema uh, is going to preclude visibility, I think marking should always be done. Agreed. Yes, always mark. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. Yes. I, I, I don't, I've done many uh, hundreds, I guess, at this point, but I'm never going to stop marking. <laughs> I think it's a, I think it's the way to go, certainly. And I, I totally agree with what you just said that um, DSEC is a great surgery and we get good outcomes with that. And if you are looking at an eye and you think, could I do DMEC or, or would it be more of a challenge because of the anterior chamber, then know that you never want your innovation to be worse than the way that you were going to do it before. And uh, so, eyes with tubes and eyes with uh, unstable lenses and stuff like that. Um, I, I, I'm still doing DSEC for, for lots and lots of people because of the, because I get a better outcome with that. DMEC is great for, for certain eyes. Oh yes, and there's a follow-up question as well about uh, pupillary block. You mentioned pupillary block briefly. So the question is, how do you treat pupillary block in a patient who's had DMEC surgery uh, previously? Um, the, the, um, the, the, the unfair answer is to say, try not to get it in the first place. Right. So, so, um, and the, and the way to not get it is to have a good iridotomy and to not put too much air in there. And the, and the, and when people goof, it's because they put an air bubble in there and they think it's the right size, but they, but they didn't test the pressure of the eye. So it's a big air bubble and the eyes, a high pressure. And so that's actually more air than you think it is, or they have a bunch of air that they inadvertently put behind the pupil. So try to avoid it. But if you have it, um, the, you go in there. I mean, if I, if I get it, I, 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 in my minor room, I go in there and I remove the air as soon as possible, because the longer that iris stays stuck up there, the more likely it is to have some permanent uh, uh, synechii and, and trabecular meshwork damage and sometimes those eyes you you break the block and you get the iris down and they still get glaucoma so so fix it fast take the air out worry about the health of the tissue the cornea tissue later that's what i think thank you both so much for taking so much time to answer questions from viewers we are over time so if we want to take maybe the next two minutes just to wrap up if there's any urgent questions still left there and of course welcome to to reach out um, and contact with us for additional questions that aren't answered during this time <laughs>